So I'd like to thank you all for being here. My name is Jenny Long, and I am a newly hired instructor at Modesto Junior College. And I jumped at the opportunity to introduce my friend here. So Heidi has taught for 35 years, 30 of which have been at Modesto Junior College. Uh, this talk was inspired by sabbatical travels that focused on math history. I'm inspired by that. I can't wait to earn a sabbatical someday and do the same thing. Due to those travels, she had the opportunity to contribute to the recent NOVA program, Zero to Infinity. So look for her name in the credits at the end of that, okay? It's very cool. Her greatest joy in teaching mathematics is helping people overcome their fear of math, and she finds that telling the stories of mathematicians and math history be positively impacting in that regard. So Heidi is going to wow you and inspire you, and I give you Heidi Meyer. sharing with you about John Napier, a mathematician that I'm very impressed with and enjoy very much. We'll be spending a lot of time with his calculating devices, the bones and the abacus, but I do want to talk about a bit about his life also and put him in context for us. So he was born in 1550, died in 1617. Uh, his nickname is Marvelous Murkiston. So in terms of those dates, 1550 to 1617, Got a little timeline here. There was a great deal that was going on in astronomical discovery at this time. So I want to put him in context in terms of those astronomers. So just prior to his life was Nicholas Copernicus. And then basically contemporary with him were Tycho Brahe and Galileo and Kepler. And there was a bit of interaction, at least a little bit. Um, Brahe and Napier actually had an acquaintance in common. So there was a little bit of sharing of back and forth. And the uh, invention that came out of this from Napier is the logarithms. Now, that's not what we're going to be talking about today. In fact, the logarithms were so powerful and useful that they kind of overshadowed the devices that I'll be sharing about today. Um, and that's that's. Well, maybe it's not sad, it's a great thing that logarithms were invented, but it's a little sad that these other devices got overshadowed. A couple hundred years after this invention, mathematician Pierre Simon Laplace said that by shortening calculations that would have taken months to just a few days, that Napier had doubled the life of the astronomer. <laughs> so um, what we're going to be focusing on are uh, devices that come out of his book, The Rhabdology. And it was his focus throughout his adult life to simplify calculations in any way that he could. And so rhabdology, the root of that word, has to do with rods or bones, which is what we're going to be looking at soon. But I want to share a quote from the introduction to this book. To perform calculations is a difficult and lengthy process, the tedium of which deters many from the study of mathematics. I have always tried, with such strength and talent as I possess, to expedite the process. And he certainly did. So there are three devices that are talked about in this book. We will be looking at two of them. One is Napier's Bones. That picture is of a set that's approximately 300 years old. These were very widely used um, over centuries. And then we'll also be looking at Napier's chessboard abacus. Um, before we get into that, I want to continue to talk a little bit about his life and also what inspired me. Um, so I did have a sabbatical, as Jenny was saying. Um, in 2016, I took a travel sabbatical. And honestly, Edinburgh, which is where Napier is from, was a bit of an afterthought. I was going to spend a couple days there looking at Napier, looking to Mary Fairfax, Somerville, and move on. Um, you know, other places that were included were Cambridge, Oxford, Gettingen, Paris, and yet it was Edinburgh and John Napier that really stood out to me. Um, I mentioned the nickname earlier, Marvelous Murkiston. This is Murkiston Castle, where he was born. Um, we're going to take a look at the back side. It's an L-shaped tower house. We call it a castle. It could also be called a defensive tower house. And if we look at this side, notice the window. 
that's looking in from the outside, here's looking out from the inside. Very easy to shoot out of, not so easy to shoot into, and of course it wouldn't have had glass and insulation on it back in the day. Um, you might be, well, I wish I hadn't advanced the slides so fast because I wanted you to think about what it looks like on the inside. You might think it's pretty dark and dreary given that it was a defensive structure, but this is one of the ceilings inside and it does date back to the early 17th century. Could have been put in towards the end of Napier's life. So just, I don't know, when I walked into this building, it took me by surprise to see that. So speaking of a defensive structure, where is the front door? So what they would have done is they would have had a wooden staircase constructed for daily use. Then if you hear an army's coming, you bring everything inside and you dismantle the staircase and there's not a front door to go through. Um, so most of my pictures are pretty narrowly focused. The first couple were looking up. That's because this has actually been subsumed by modern buildings around it. In fact, it's in the center. <laughs> the magic of photography, folks. <laughs> this is Edinburgh Napier University. But actually, kind of thanks to them, we still have the building. They restored it, you know, of course. And can you imagine having a castle as the focal point of your campus? A castle that a famous mathematician lived in? So back, back to Napier, he was most likely educated at home as a child. Um, when he was 13 years old, he headed north to St. Andrews, and he attended um, St. Salvatore's College at St. Andrews University. If there's any fans of the Royals here, this is where Kate and William met, St. Salvatore's College. Um, this is the chapel, here's a picture from the other side. Certainly, um, Renovations and such must have gone on in the hundreds of years that have passed since his time, but he would recognize this if he were able to come back today. He would recognize that building. Just another quick picture of St. Andrew's coastline. Um, there's the ruin of the um, cathedral here, and over here there's a ruin of the castle, but would not have been ruined at this time. It's actually surprising that he studied in Scotland. When he was a 10-year-old, his uncle, who was a bishop, Bishop of Orkney, uh, sent a letter to his dad. And it said, I pray you, sir, send your son to France or Flanders, <coughs> for he can learn no good at home. <laughs> uh, and it, it was true at the time. Scotland, you know, later went through the Scottish Enlightenment. There were some amazing scholars, amazing scholarship was done there. But at the time, the educational system was not strong. And so his uncle was encouraging his dad, and this is when Napier was a 10-year-old, sent him to the continent because he can't learn any good here in Scotland. So actually, Napier only stayed at uh, St. Andrews for a few months, and then he did move on to the continent. And so in the letter, it said Flanders or France. Uh, these, these are all very likely places where he could have gone for various reasons. Um, in the 1560s, when he was here, um, Scotland was undergoing a Protestant Reformation. And um, so the Low Countries um, would have been kind of a haven for Protestantism. The University of Paris uh, would have been a good choice at that time. Geneva, Switzerland would have been a particularly good choice. There was a, a group of young men from Scotland uh, that were there. And um, this is Theodore Beza took over after John Calvin, and he was a um, Greek scholar. It was illegal to teach Greek in Scotland at the time, and Napier really wanted to learn Greek. Um, he may have gotten as far south, south, south as Padua or Bologna. We don't know. Um, there are no records of him graduating, but it wouldn't have been uncommon at the time for him to have traveled, for a young man to have traveled from place to place, learning under the scholars that they wanted to learn under, and just move from place to place. Um, if you go to a science museum and there's a, a display on Napier, you are likely to see a black rooster. Because Napier had a reputation of being a sorcerer. And it was thought that his black rooster, which he did carry around with him, actually he was poulterer to the king. So he had poultry, so he had access to a lot of poultry. 
but it seemed that he kind of um, enjoyed fostering this reputation of being a sorcerer, which is maybe a little bit strange because it was a pretty dangerous thing at the time. Um, King James VI of Scotland was reigning at that time, and he was such a persecutor of witchcraft and, and sorcery that he actually wrote the book on the subject, literally. Here's how to hunt down witches and kill them. Um, this apparently did not deter Napier. This is a picture of the ruins of Fast Castle. And he entered into a contract to use his sorcerer's skills to find hidden treasure at Fast Castle. And the contract is written in his own hand. Um, so it seems a little dangerous to me. And the contract still exists, or at least existed for hundreds of years beyond his lifetime. Uh, it doesn't look to me like you could fit a castle in that promontory. <laughs> But if we look from the side, you can see that it has kind of terraces. And this, this part right here is actually more than twice, it's a wall, still standing wall, that's more than twice as tall as I am. And then here's a picture looking down, there are a lot of cliffs at the base, so there's lots of um, smuggling activity, which is one of the things that might have led to a discovery of treasure. Um, this whole sorcery business is a little weird, because not only was it dangerous at the time, but also, Napier was a deeply religious man. He was a Christian, he was an elder in his church, St. Cuthbert's. It's a different building than it would have been at his time, but he was an elder at this church. Also, he was sent as a delegate to the General Assembly of the Kirk of Scotland, so he was very highly regarded. Um, and, as did Sir Isaac Newton after him, Napier wrote uh, theolo theological works, theology, don't worry so much. I hate to put so much text on the screen. I have put all of these dates in the handout that's inside your packet, so don't worry too much. But basically, I wanted to show what was going on. So in 1517, before his birth, we have the Protestant Reformation happening on the continent. Then in the 1560s, it makes its way to Scotland. We have the Spanish Armada, so this is Spain versus England, but Scotland is also part of it. And you know, Scotland being Protestant, Spain being Catholic. We have the affair of the Scottish Lines, which ties in. I don't want to go into too much detail with all this. But in 1593, so five years after the Spanish Armada, Napier publishes this theology, which in part is a defense of his country, because it's partly a defense of the religion of his country. And then in 1594, he wrote a document titled Secret Inventions. And it's similar to what um, Leonardo da Vinci wrote in terms of um, coming up with ideas for submarines and flying machines and tanks and things like that. And, um, and similar also to Archimedes. Um, we've got a mention here of burning mirrors. So this is Anno Domini, 1596, 7th of June, secret inventions, um, and so on. So that, that's in his own handwriting, and that does still exist. Um, you, can, you can go see that in London. Talk to me for details later if you're interested. But I'm going to wrap up the biography part and get into the calculating devices. We will look first at Napier's bones. And so go ahead and, and get into your packet. I have more packets up here if they are needed. And you should find three things in there if anything is missing. Let us know because we can do you whatever you're missing. But you should have a little bag of pins. You should have a tan envelope with the laws in it. And you should have a handout. And the front page of that handout does have those dates that I was talking about. In case you're <coughs> so what we're going to do is go ahead and just leave. If you haven't taken them out yet, leave the laws in the envelope for now. If you've taken them out already, it's perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. But this is what we're going to be focusing on first. And I just want to point out the structure. So what I have on the screen here is um, just a, a multiplication table, right? And Napier's rods, they're also called Napier's bones. I'll go back and forth in terms of what I call them. Um, sets were originally made out of ivory. And so you have these long, thin strips made out of ivory, so they look like bones. So sometimes we call them Napier's bones. Sorry, I couldn't afford the ivory. <laughs> um, so, you know, just a, just a quick refresher. It may have been a long time since you worked with the multiplication table. But let's say we go for 2 times 8. 
We're going to cross-reference that. That's going to be 16. Notice that we have the diagonal line down the middle separating the tens place from the ones place. Um, if you've worked with lattice multiplication, you might be familiar with this kind of thing already. Um, but this has been, as I said, cut vertically. So here's your rod for the multiples of two. And we, we do have a rod that doesn't have a header up at the top. It's just basically our reference rod, the digits one through nine. Um, you also have two rods that I'm going to call plates. They're a little wider. One is for taking square roots, one is for taking cube roots. And we need just one little thing before we dive in and get started using these. So we are used to adding vertically in columns. But when we're using these rods, we're going to have to be OK going along the diagonal a bit. So we will be setting up the rods, and we will be reading across the row. And so this is, this is a number in the thousands. We've got a ones. Oh, well, that went way too fast. Anyway, ones place is eight. Tens place, we get the one plus the six. They're both in the tens place, so we get seven. And hundreds place is five. Thousand place is one. So we're representing 1,578. Sometimes you need to carry from one diagonal to the next. So we've got um, this example here. We've got a four in the ones place, but then we have a 13. So we write the three, carry the one. We're going to get two plus four is six plus one is seven. And then we have the four. So we kind of have to um, orient our eyes for how we're going to be looking at this. And I'm going to be using virtual manipulatives, so I'm going to need to sit down as we're doing this, and hopefully all goes as planned. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is some multiplication. We're going to do 23 times 2 first. So I'm sorry, I didn't ever tell you you could go ahead and get those out. Go ahead and, and take the rods out of the packet. I did place them in there in numerical order, so if you take them out kind of slowly, you can line them up and it's just a little easier to grab what you need. There's no hurry. Well, I don't have a watch on. I could talk about Napier all day. Somebody might have to alert me when I'm going over time. <laughs> yes? I have doubles of each rod. Good. You should have doubles of each rod. If you don't, it may not be a problem. It just depends. The problem we're working, are we go going to end up getting multiples of that digit? And we do have extras up front. So if anybody only got a single or something, um, yes. yeah, we have extras up here. And while you're setting things up, I just want to let you know, we're working on paper, and it's nice stiff paper, so it should work fine. But it is possible to, to purchase sets of these. Back in Napier's time, they would have been far smaller. In fact, they were so small, I don't know how they read the numbers prior to the invention of glasses. <laughs> but um, here's my square root rod and my cube root rod, and then all of the numbers. So this, you can get them made out of wood, you can get them made out of metal. So if you're interested, they, they do exist. They are available. Um, or you can make your own, and I'll show you a picture of a set that I made in just a few minutes. OK, so again, we're going to multiply, first of all, 23 times 2. So I have my reference rod, the one that just has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, no diagonals on it. That's going to be off to the left. And I'm going to grab a 2 rod and a 3 rod in order to create the number 23. And I want to place that right next to my reference rod. And if at any point I need to slow down, let me know. But I think trying to manipulate this with a mouse is possibly going to slow me down enough. Um, in order to do 2 times 23, we're going to look at the second row. And then we're just going to read off what's back here. So 2 times 23, as I do that diagonal reading that I was talking about, um, I see that that gives us 46. I see the 46 sitting there. Okay, so there we go. 
these, um, Napier invented this. Remember, his goal was that he wanted to simplify calculation. And um, so the, the main idea behind this is that it would do the, the multiplication for you. It would do the multiplication for you. You didn't need to know your multiplication facts. And this was at a time when people were still switching over from Roman numerals to Hindu Arabic. So in a lot of cases, people didn't know their multiplication tables. So this was a very helpful thing. Um, OK, so next up, let's just do, how about 23 times 9? Um, so we're going to go down to the row with the 9 in it. So what we're focused on is right behind the 9. And so I see that 9 times 23. Here in the 1's place, I have a 7. And in the 10's place, I have a 10. So we're going to put down the 0 and carry the 1. And so I get 207. So you, know, you did need a piece of paper nearby to, to do your work on. You did need to do some adding, but this would do the multiplication for you. So any, any questions about that? I don't want to rush from one thing to the next too quickly. OK. Because what we're going to do next is square roots. We're going to take square roots. How do you multiply by something bigger than uh, oh, a digit? Fantastic question. So let's say that we want to multiply um, 15, that's a wonderful question. 15 times 23, okay? So let's get this off of here. What you would do is you would multiply um, a five, here's your, here's your 23, and I'm gonna multiply by five. So five times 23 gives me 115. That is right here. So 115. And then I'm going to multiply, and let's go in a different color, then I'm going to multiply by the 1, but I'm just going to offset it to hold for place value. Yeah, so 1 times 23 is going to give us, of course, 23. And because that 1 isn't really a 1, it's a 10, um, we're going to offset that. You can put a 0 at the back if you'd like, and we add. Now we're adding, we're adding vertically now. So you have to add diagonally and vertically. But 23 times 15 is 345. And, you know, by analogy, you could just, you could move on to three digits, four digits, whatever you want, just by moving it over for place value. Yeah. Anything else before we get to the square roots? <laughs> okay, do square roots. I heard it, do square roots. Okay. So I'm going to kind of do a little reset here by taking the 2 and the 3 off the board and put it back in my little stack down at the bottom of the page. And I'm going to grab the square root rod, which is the narrower one, and it should have a square root up at the top. You might not have an n squared 2n and n, but you should have a um, square root symbol up at the top. So let's erase our other work. And we're going to take the square root. I'll, I'll write it down. It's a pretty big number. I'll write it down. So we're going to take the square root of 104,976. We'll write the radicand and split it into doubles starting at the back. So 104,976. Split into doubles. I'm also going to mask off the last two columns of our square root rod. Um, you can easily do this by using your cube root rod and turning it down so it's blank and just cover this up so that all you're seeing is this first column. What, what do you see as you look down that first column in the square root? Like perfect square. Right? They're just the perfect squares, absolutely. Okay, so um, what we want to look for is the closest thing that goes into 10 without being over 10. So that's going to be the 9, right? Closest thing to 10 without going over. We start from left to right. And that is in row 3. So the first part of our answer is a 3, because that's the row that that came from. And 
The square root of 3 is 9. So we're going to go ahead and subtract and bring down. It's going to sound like long division. Subtract and bring down. 10 minus 9, we get a 1. And we bring down the next double. We bring down the next double. So, so how do we continue? Where do we go from here? Because I'm not just going to look at the square root rod and go, well, what's the closest thing to 149 without going over? Because it's not on there. Okay? So what we do is we take the 3 and we double it. We double it. You might, as we're working, you might want to be thinking about why double. Why does it times 2 come into play? So I'm going to move my little mask out of the way there. See, it, does, it really slows me down to be doing this with virtual manipulative, so hopefully I'm not rushing too fast on you. Uh, okay. So that 6 that I wrote under the 3, that's going to be the rod that we bring into play. This is all like a big game. This math is fun, right? So we're going to put that 6 in front of the square root plate. It's going to go in between the reference and the square root plate. We're just going to slide that right in. Um, so you might be wondering what those last two columns are for. Again, the whole point of this is that you don't have to multiply. If I don't know my multiplication tables and I'm supposed to find this 6 here, which is 3 double, well, there it is. Okay, so it's just on the far right, it's counting numbers 1 through 9, and right next to it, it's all the doubles. So you don't need to know how to do times 2. Okay. <laughs> so, he wanted to simplify calculation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's great. Okay, so um, what we are looking for now is within these two, within the 6 rod and the squares, we're looking for the closest thing to 149 without going over as we look across the rows. So I think I heard a 124. Yeah, yeah it's in the second. Um, right here, 124. You can probably see it easier on the, the rods that are in front of you instead of on what I'm doing on the screen here. But yeah, in the second row, we get a 124. If we went down to the third row, you'd be in the 180s, which is too big. So we have 124. And now I, want to, I don't want to forget to keep track of my answer. This came from the two row, and that's where you're pulling the digits of your answers from that reference. So the first two parts of our answer are 3, 2. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go ahead and subtract and bring down. So we get 2, 5, 7, 6. But then again, how do we move on? And it's the same process as before. It is super repetitive. You're going to double the two. So let's let's pull the mask away just in case we don't know our, our two times table. Right? <laughs> two doubled is four. There it is. Two doubled is four. So we're going to make a little note of that, that this is a four. And we're going to grab the four rod. And so here's the here's the thing. Where do you put it? Yeah. In front of the six, behind the six, the, the you know, where do you put it? Over the six. And over the six, right? You would get rid of the six yeah. and replace it with the four, because when you do cube roots, you actually get rid of what you already have and you replace it. Um, mm -hmm. If we get time, we will do cube roots. But I want to make sure that we talk about the, the other device as well. Okay. So, I mean, if we, don't, we don't need to keep masking this. Like, once you get used to it, your eyes just look at what you need to be looking at. So we're looking for the closest thing to 2,576 without going over. Does anybody see it? It's perfect. Why, why is it perfect, do you think? Because it's perfect. Because it's perfect square. Because I started with a perfect square. Now, I didn't have to. You can actually get into the decimal places. You can do an irrational. In fact, let's after we finish this one, let's quickly do that. Um, so you said right here in the fourth row, you we were seeing 2,576. Sure, because there's a 2, a 5, a 7, and a 6. So we subtract that off. It goes in evenly. Don't forget that what we're looking for, you did a lot of work, but we still haven't answered the question. 
right? The last digit is 4. So the square root of 104,976 is 324. Feel free to check me on that. You're welcome to do so. <laughs> okay, I don't hear anybody correcting me, so I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to do some erasing here. While I'm erasing, you might want to reset your board. Okay. So that um, you just have, get get that six and that four out of there. We're going to take the square root of two because I know y'all are familiar with the square root of two. So you're going to know. You're going to know. You won't have to get out your cell phones and check me. Um, so yeah, let's get these out of the way. By the way, if we don't get as far as taking cube roots, I do have a video up online where there's information about that in your package. So I hope to do a square root, but if we don't, you'll be able to find a video of me explaining it. Okay, so I want to take the square root of two. Always your first step in taking a square root is going to be to put that, that plate there. We don't have any of those other rods in. We start with the plate. Um, we want to take square root of 2, and you know, what is that? So we come down here and we break it up into doubles, yeah, except there's only a 2. So we look down this column and we say what's the closest perfect square to 2 without going over, which is 1. Okay, so we're going to subtract that off. Okay, square root of 2 is 1, we're done. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. So what you do, just like in a long division process, is you extend it with zeros, but we're going to extend it with doubles, not just one zero, but with two zeros at a time. It's all about doubles when you're doing square roots. So you go ahead and bring this down. Um, as before, it takes a little while to get used to the steps, but once you've done it a couple times, you really can rock and roll with this. It actually goes pretty fast. So you find your digit. Then you double it. Then you grab the rod representing the double. You slap it in front of the square root plate. Get it all casual. You slap it in front of that square root plate. Okay, so here's this is a two, and I'm grabbing a two because it's the double of one. Okay, not because I'm taking the square root of two, but because it's the double of one. And once again, our focus, again, I can mask it off if I want, and so can you. So I'm looking for the closest thing to 100 in these two columns here without going over. And I know you know what the square root of 2 is to at least a couple of decimal places. So what, what row is that in? Row 4. Yeah, because look, right here we get um, 96, but if we went down to row 5, we have 125, which is too big. So we have um, 96. Right? 8 plus 1 is 9, and then we've got a 6 at the back. So the key is, what row are we in? For we're going to put our decimal point here, because that is where we started adding zeros to the end. Right. Okay? And so we continue with the process. And I'm talking as if you've done this 17 times already, but uh, it just it's it's very repetitive. Yeah, eight. I just heard eight. Good yeah, job. Four doubled is eight. So four doubled is eight. And if you don't remember, you know, you've got these other two columns at the back, it's like remember you're doubling. What if you get a two-digit number when you double? Oh, good question. I have an example of that. Okay. Um, actually I may just I may just how are we doing on time? Uh, we got like 25 minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, I, may, I will give a verbal answer and then I'll come, we'll see how we're doing on time and I'll come back to that and do another example. Yeah. The, the simple answer is you carry. You don't, with square roots, you never put two rods in front of, uh, you, you never slide two rods into the space because it has to do with place value. And you need to just, just have one place. Oh, so you might change the rod before. Right, you would carry. So if this had been an 8 in our answer and you got a 16, you would remove this rod and replace it with a 3. Okay. You would carry. You would carry. 
And this too, I do have videos up, so if there's anything that we don't get to, um, I, do, I want you guys, I don't want you to leave here like, wait, she didn't do that thing. That's what I wanted to know about. Okay, so we just put the single one in there. It always goes in front of the plate. You don't put it in front of the two. The two stays where it is. Because we're working our way down place value. Right, I'm here, you, you guys are doing great. You're like ahead of me. You're like, what, if, what about this? Oh, I see a 400. Okay, so we're going to subtract. And we need to have, we need to extend it with two more zeros. And we bring them down. So you're absolutely right. It's a 400. And so where do we see a 400, something close to 400 without going over? Way up at the top. Okay, right, because if we come down here, we've got 500. We're already up to 500. I kind of covered up that five for the 500. Let's take a quick look at that. So yeah, if you came down to this row down below, um, you would be at 564. And that's too big because we're looking for a 400. So that's in row one. The next part of our answer is a one. Um, we would write the 281 here. We would subtract, giving us 119. We would once again extend, bring down, and then in order to find the next rod that we're going to be putting in place, we would take that one that we just got, double it, which gives us a two. Um, we would grab another two rod, put it in place, and we would just continue with the process. I think you've got the idea. So let's go ahead and look at some um, rods or bones that are from not too long after Napier's time. This first image is from a Napier display in the National Museum of Scotland. There are two sets here. The one on the right is kind of cut off. Um, both of them are hundreds of years old. The one to the right is made out of flat strips, like what we've been working with. But if you look at the one on the left that I'm highlighting, these are actually prisms and can more truly be called rods. They have digits on each of the four long sides of the rods. And so one thing that this takes care of is an issue of not having enough of a certain digit to carry out your work. Another thing that comes into play here is that um, this ties into nine's complement. And given our time frame today, I can't really get into that, but that's something you could look into in other resources if you're interested. Here's a set that I made. I went to the hobby store, bought some wooden cubes, glued them together, and then covered the long sides with the multiplication facts. This next image is from a science museum in Paris. It's called CNAM, and you'll see here two sets of Napier's bones. On the left-hand side, you see the prisms. And these are, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that, but it's day neighbor. And over here, the same thing. Um, so there's a closer look. So it actually has the rods in here, but they're on cylinders, and you can spin it. So you've got lots of options of digits, right? But on top, oops, go back. Um, on top, this is not a multiplication table. That's an addition table, because what if you don't know your addition facts? <laughs> so it's super automated. Super automated. So we're going to go ahead and make sure we get some time to work with the chessboard abacus as well. Uh, Napier, he put this at the end of his book, and the Rhabdology, and he said this is more of a lark than a labor. So we'll say this thing is more of a lark than a labor.
So yeah, this is what you should have, a little pack of pennies. You have a little check for it. I went through my big penny jar of pennies and chose the shiniest ones. And they, they have been washed, by the way. I washed them in hot soap and water. So I have some candy for you. Now, I've been calling this the chessboard abacus. Maybe you're called it that, but we also called it location arithmetic. Now, as you guys look at this, your brain is probably just going binary, binary, binary. But maybe you wouldn't have been thinking that way. And this is part of why you called it location arithmetic. Like, the number is based on where you put the pieces. Well, yeah, we call that place value. Um, so a 10 is an 8 or 2, right? How about a 21?
Okay. So let's do one that illustrates something else that could come up. Let's do 12 times 7. It's probably easiest if you make the 7 on the far right because you already have a 6 there. So I've got a 7 on the right, and I'm going to make a 12 on the bottom. Oh, I'm so, you know, I should be writing these down. I'm just saying them. Um, we're doing 12 times 7. And so again, rows and columns. Fill in the places of intersection. So you should get a three by two rectangle. If any of you teach math for elementary teachers, you might be thinking of the rectangular area model of multiplication. Okay, again, we're going to slide down. It doesn't matter what you start with, but you're going to run into a bit of a surprise on this one. <laughs> They're stacking. They're stacking. So I'm going to start sliding. This is where I'm at so far. I haven't quite dragged everything down. I'm going to grab this penny up on the top. It doesn't matter. The order does not matter. But you're dragging it down. And so I have two pennies now sitting there right above 16. Well, two groups of 16 is one group of 32. So I'm going to move one of these over and just drag the other one off the board. But two groups of 32 is right. So if you have, but you don't have to know that. You don't have to know your multiplication tables. You just know that you're doubling, and a group of two becomes one group to the left. And oh, look, we have one more to drag down. That's another double. But a double on the right is a single to the left. And so I didn't ask you ahead of time what the answer should be, but let's look at what we got. We got, uh, what, 80 plus 4, we got 84, and last time I checked, 12 times 7 was in fact 84. Okay? Sorcery. Sorcery. Here too, um, we won't take the time to do it, but here too, you can square roots. I have to do a square root example, you guys, because you have to be able to see a square root on here, too. If there's stuff we don't get to that you want to see, check out the videos. The, um, the, the YouTube channel is uh, listed on the back page of your handout packet. I wish I could just keep you here all day and do all the things. <laughs> I did ask for a double session because I wanted to do Napier's Life and have an hour for that, and Napier's devices and have an hour for that. I said choose one, so I'm like, okay, all right. Okay, so we're gonna do, let's do the square root of 49. So we found 49 earlier when we were doing our warm up. It's 32 plus 16 plus one. I was gonna do 25 first. It's a little bit easier, but I know I'm short on time. So I wanna give you the harder example. Something you may wanna do, if you have a writing implement with you, you may just want to mark, put a little dot in the center along the diagonal from the bottom right to the top left. Because the first placement of the penny is going to have to go on that diagonal. And so what we're going to be doing, we're going to be literally creating a square. This is a square number. 49 is a square number. We're going to make a picture of a square and then we're going to read the answer off the side off the bottom. So we're kind of reversing what we did earlier. Now I'm going to bring the, the penny by the 32 into play, bringing it onto the game board. But as I slide it diagonally in the reverse direction from earlier up to the right, mm. it doesn't hit mm. one of my red dots. It doesn't land on a, on a square that represents a perfect square, not 2 times 2 or 4 times 4 or whatever. So we're going to reverse the carrying process. 132? is two sixteens. Okay, so you're always going to the right, you double, going to the left, you cut in half. We're going to pull a penny from the 16 onto the board and take it diagonally until we hit that diagonal. This is the top of our square. If you guys have ever done a proof that um, the squares are the sum of the odd numbers, this is one. The next thing we're going to be looking for as we make a square, we're going to look for a shell, an L shape, that has three pennies in it. Hmm. So it'll either be here, 
or it'll be like here, here, here. We're going to get an L shape, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you. We'll do it. We will do it. This is going faster than I wanted to. If you, if you bring one of those 16, don't, don't do this. If you bring one of the 16 pennies in, that's no good because it's left of the square or it's above the square that we're trying to create. The thing that's, that's on the board already is the top left of our square. So I'm going to regroup again. The two pennies at the number 16 are going to both double and become four pennies at the eight. So you double each one of them. You just double. As you go to the right, you double. <coughs> one 16 becomes two eights. Well, you already used one, one of the 16s, though, up in I, I had three, though, because we had a 32. The original setup was 32, oh, 16, right. and 1. Yeah. So I used one of the 16s, but I still had two left for oh, regrouping the 32. Oh, okay. I didn't throw an extra one one yeah. one. That's what it's, it is. Okay. Oh, I'm going to slow it down. No. It's so bad. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, the eight, slide it onto the board and then slide diagonally to the top of the square. Okay. Slide another eight onto the board, slide diagonally to the left side of the square. Now, we need to complete a square right here, but if we slide on another eight, it's going to be on this diagonal outside of the square. So I once again know that I need to regroup. And so those two eights are going, they're each going to, to become a double at the four level. So I'm going to get four fours. And we're going to slide one of those on to the board. Don't slide it on diagonally. Slide it on straight up, but then go diagonally. And look, there's that L shape that I was talking about. You've got three pennies there in the shape of an L. Okay. Yeah, kind of completing the square. Now, I need to, I still have pennies left. Uh, so as I... ...diagonally to the right and up. You slide the two straight on, you slide the one straight on. Does anybody remember what we were doing? I should have written this yeah. 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 pretty yeah. light. Yeah. What? Um, it's seven by seven. It's seven by yeah. seven, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, and the square root of 49 is seven. And you might wonder about bigger numbers. Yeah, make a bigger board. Okay. And I'm a little too into this. I bought some felt and got a permanent marker and I can roll it up and take it with me anywhere. I carry a calculator. This is more fun. This is more fun. This is more fun. Okay. Um, so, okay. So I hear that we have five minutes. Um. Yeah, there's so much. I'll tell you what, we're up to slide. What's going on with the chicken? Oh my goodness, let me tell the chicken story. Let yeah, tell, tell the, the chicken, chicken story. So, Napier did. We wonder why he cultivated a reputation as a sorcerer because you could get killed for it. Plus, he was in the church and how would he be respected if he was doing sorcery? Um, so, anyway, this reputation of a sorcerer made people around him kind of fearful and respectful of him. And um, so he knew at one point in time that his servants were, one of his servants was stealing from him. And so he said, okay, you guys got all the servants together. And he said, um, my rooster is over there in the outbuilding. Everybody needs to watch for one at a time and you need to pet the rooster. And I'm going to go in after all the servants have gone through and the rooster's going to tell me who's been stealing. <laughs> and he figured out who was stealing from him. Sorcery. Well, no, as some of you I'm sure know, he had coated his black rooster in coal dust. He had such a reputation that the servants were afraid they would be found out. So the one who was guilty did not touch the rooster and came out with clean hands. <laughs> clever man, Napier. Very clever man. So thank you for coming. Appreciate working with you guys. Certificate for you on behalf of.
CMCQ. Thank you for being a presenter. You bet.